Good morning. I suppose I should begin today's message the same way that I begin my lectures at the start of each semester. I'm sorry. Because I love to joke around and I have this spiritual gift or curse of always pushing humor too far, so I need to apologize in advance, get it out of the way. And I think because I love to joke around so much, take things to the limit as far as I can is rubbed off onto my two girls. They are eight and six. My first daughter had to tell her class a few years ago, what does your father do? And I'm a sociologist, but she thought she'd be creative and tell the class, my father's a social allergy. And that's what she said day after day. A few weeks ago, I had to give a guest sermon at another church a different one that we normally attend. And I was running around trying to get them ready, make breakfast, get them to eat. I was dying. I was exasperated. I thought I was going to lose my mind. Were it not for the sermon I had to give, I may have lost some holiness. So I was begging my kids, do I have to tell you every little thing to do? Wear this. Don't wear that. Don't poke her in the eye. Don't do this. Don't spill. Hurry up. Blah, 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 blah. My first daughter looks at me with very serious face and tone. Of course you do, Daddy. You have to tell us everything to do because you're our Daddy. That's what Daddies are supposed to do. She looks at my other kid. Ah ha ha, they're laughing at me. <laughs> Cain and Cain. Should have been the names of my kids. <laughs> my second daughter has humor and an edge. This was some years ago when she was still a toddler. They used to stay at the dinner table forever. My wife and I came up with this idea. Let us take away the dessert and perhaps not spoil the ride. So I used to say, okay, now we have a shot clock. You better hurry up or you're going to be in trouble. So I said this to my first daughter. She had tears in her eyes. Daddy, please don't spank me. If I hurry up, would everything be okay? Of course, that's the whole point. Eat so we can do other things in life. My second daughter, hands on the table, still in diapers at this point, looking at me eye to eye. After my spanking, can I have my chocolate? <laughs> like you, all I could do was laugh. These are some of the moments where I have experienced God's faithful presence. And as I unpack the journey that God has brought me thus far, you will see why I believe my life today is all the more sweeter in God's presence. From my pre-teens to my mid-twenties, I had a lot of afflictions. I spent a lot of time in prayer of what to share this morning. And God continued, drew, continually drew me to this passage that struck a chord in me when I was in college. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father some nuances, originator of, nuances of mercies, yes, withholding judgment, but also of pity, compassion, encouragement, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, nuances of mental state or outward circumstances, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You ask me what are the most painful moments of my life, the afflictions, I would say family, education, and church. For personal reasons, I will share the first two and not about church. One, family. As a kid, I just wanted to be normal. That's all I wanted to be, a normal kid. I don't know what it is about the sound of music, but my parents made us watch it all the time. And my father loved the scene with Captain Von Trapp where he blew the whistle. And he said, when I come home, my children shall stand in a straight line. And I'm thinking, Dad, there are only two of us. <laughs> Not a genius, but two points usually makes a line. I don't know why we had this intercom system in our Michigan house. In each room, you could listen and talk to other people. And there was this speaker in the backyard. You couldn't see it, but it was behind the trees. And I, we had a pretty nice backyard, and I'd throw the football, play soccer, or throw the baseball with my friends. And my father loved to embarrass me by turning on the intercom and speaking 
in Korean. How many Koreans lived in our neighborhood? Zero, except for us. How many Korean friends did I have? Zero. He intentionally did this to embarrass me. So we'd be throwing the ball and you hear this, oh, clunk. Ball would hit me in the head. Because I knew what my father was going to do. And he just loved to do this in Korean. It was embarrassing. My mother could not figure out how to use this. <laughs> so it sounded like someone at the drive-thru where it's crackling. Again, in Korean, you hear this, and then Korean language on and off. She gave up. She'd open the patio door and scream at the top of her lungs in Korean. How far was I? About from here to the fifth row. <laughs> Just be like this. Oh, it was horrible. I was very, very embarrassed. And I used to say, can we just fit in? I, has, I used to have so much fear about trying to be normal. As I grew up, our small arguments turned into screaming matches. I've lost count how many bloody noses I've received from my father. How many slaps, punches, and kicks as I was growing up. My father wasn't just tough physically. He's very tough psychologically. He used to walk through the front area of the TV where the TV area was, and I'd be watching TV, and my father would just stop and pause to look at me and say, the fat boy with no friends, and walk on by. That was the greeting, because in his mind, I had never amounted to much. After my family received Christ individually, the family of four as Lord and Savior, after we were publicly baptized to proclaim our allegiance to Christ and the local church, somehow, somewhere, I don't know exactly all the particulars, our family utterly fell apart. My mother's health began to deteriorate after she received Christ. And I remember in junior high, my mother yelling at God and my mother yelling at my father. I remember screaming to God, God, how dare you take away my health after I have given you my life? Who do you think you are after I have surrendered my everything to you that I would be unable to walk, have to use a bedpan, all these sorts of things. I remember her yelling at my father, divorce me, don't look at me, get out of here, take the kids, start a new life. Now you would think, as a junior high student, I would have some compassion, but because of the way that we continue to fight, I had so much bitterness and anger, I had no compassion on my mother whatsoever. My mother begged me, please, talk to me. My father threatened me. My sister said, I have nightmares of you fighting with mom, and the end result is blood on an ax. My sister was traumatized. Because I realized when you don't like somebody, you can hate and you take hate to a new level, you ignore as if the person does not even exist. My father looked at me eye to eye. He said, talk to your mother. And my answer was, how can you talk to somebody who's dead? And I think part of the reason why I had so much anger, especially towards my mother, had to do with the second affliction or pain, education. For my mother, it was not good enough to do my best. I had to be the best. And there's one moment where I realized I'm going to give up on education. What is the point? I remember my sister, she was always a nerd. And she had the nice grades. She said, guess what we got today? We got our grades. Ugh. So my mother said, okay, let me see. And at this time she was still ill. So my sister shows the grades. My mother goes down, A, 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 A minus A, A, A seven or eight grades, one A minus, the rest were A's. And my mother lost her mind. She went berserk, started yelling, screaming, throwing things. My sister was crying. What was I doing? The moonwalk. My grades did not have a vowel. It stuttered. I was asked to explain my grades. Had no answer. What could I say? I overachieved in a class, no response. 
And my father, when we moved to Michigan, said, you're not a genius. Originally, I wanted you to go to some specific schools on the East Coast. He said, you're not a genius, so we moved here to Michigan. This is the public university that you will go to. Yeah, I'm thinking, hereditary issues, blows to the head, do not improve gray matter. All these things are going in the back of my mind. But he's enforcing, you're going to get a public education. And I was always compared to my sister. Oh, the relatives would say, there's Teresa. She's so smart. She's beautiful. She's so pretty. Great at music. Excellent grades. And they would look at me as I had long hair. Oh, and there's Henry. That was sad. It was tough. I began to be engaged in destructive behaviors, stealing whatever I could do. When I was in junior high, I was arrested. I was put in a jail cell till my father picked me up. And he had a nervous breakdown. He said he'd never imagined coming to this country he would ever have to go to jail and pick up his son. And my heart was so hardened, I just didn't care. I began not to just be destructive towards other people and property, but towards myself. In junior high, before I would begin school, I began to experiment with alcohol. Because my father had become born again, but he did not throw away all of the alcohol in the cabinet, so I would drink. By high school, I would drink at school, cut classes, and begin to smoke pot. Sometimes after school, on the weekends, I was utterly stoned out of my mind for four years. And I mean, so high as a kite, I'm hallucinating. And I continue this pattern all the way through high school. And by college, I wanted to die. I began to smoke so much pot, drink 151 proof Bacardi, no chasers. And my goal was either to numb the pain away or die. And my friends said that I would black out. They had to carry me back. And they would tell me all these horrific things that I've done. I couldn't remember a thing. And I thought by doing this, I'm running away from God. Years later, my parents told me, when I had left for college, they had been praying for me for years, every day, every day, every day. My freshman year, God brought a Christian resident assistant in my life. And he shared his testimony about how he had a new relationship with Jesus Christ. And I remember all of these passages from my youth. Isaiah 53, 6, John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Romans 3, 10, 6, 23, etc., etc., etc. And I knew I had to get my life right with the Lord. I began to memorize scripture, write scripture, and as God worked in my heart, as the cliche goes, forgiveness is not forgetting, but a different way of remembering. There are some things that have happened in my life, in my family, I don't think I will ever forget. But as my life is tied into God's history, His story, I have a different way of remembering what happened. God remembered me to, God allowed me to remember the past in a different way. And as probably my favorite theologian of all time has said, Yoda. <laughs> Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. When I read 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 in college, I sensed that this is why I have so much pain and affliction. As a sophomore, I realized God had given me a calling based on the pain, that my pains left to myself were a liability, but surrendered to Christ, they would be a kingdom asset. And I was so excited, I called my father. I said, Dad, I know what God wants me to do for the rest of my life. It is my destiny. I know what it is. And I shared. And there was a silence on the phone that seemed forever. My father said, son, who is going to listen to you? That was his response. My students could have told me that. <laughs> we told you. Well, you weren't listening, so you couldn't have. And now I know that 
as an extreme introvert, God had flipped the script. A lot of people ask, well, what's happened since when I share this in other situations? My father became my best friend in my mid-20s. I realized through all of the immigration experiences and enacting a sociological imagination in a Christian context, why my father and my parents were that the way that they were in, in this country. I remember going to my mother and asking for forgiveness for the years of silence and pretending that she was dead. No birthday cards, no Christmas cards, nothing. I remember going to my mother and hearing her response. Son, I have always loved you, and I have been waiting for you, my son, to return. I remember collapsing and sobbing in her arms. And in light of this week's motif, I think this is what it feels like to be in God's faithful presence. That this is family, this is home. I remember my father trying to be a quote-unquote man, under the covers, sobbing, hysterically, pretending that he was asleep, but the whole bed is going through an earthquake. But at least he was in a line with my mother. It was a perfect line. Uh, and it is in this context for me to stand here that I ended in this way to say thank you on behalf of my entire family to the students, to the institution, and for the motif that we have that it is not just nominal, but it is real in the presence of God for Christ and his kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Father, we fall down before you in light of everything that has been going on, that we know that we need you, that we are broken, and that at the end of the day, it is not about any individual nor institution, but it is about the name of Jesus Christ, the sweet wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior. In whatever context or units of analysis that we have pain and affliction, may you give us comfort so that our liabilities may become a kingdom asset. May you continue to bless us, give us wisdom and fortitude to press forward into the 21st century as a powerful light and salt the proclamation of the awesome gospel and that we are not ashamed because it is the only source of true power to change lives. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for this morning.